trying to get crazy with this scene. Don't you know I'm loco? Yeah, so Teen Angel did several other magazines. Uh, the magazine that Bobby was referring to was called Corazon, and he probably did about 10 or 12 issues, and that was a magazine that was geared towards the Chicano trucker. And as we all know, there's a lot of Chicanos that are into the trucking industry. So he did this whole magazine where the trucks were all kind of low rided out with big gangster white walls and fender skirts and everything. In addition to that, he did Green Angels magazine, which was geared towards Chicanos or, that were in the military. What's up, people? Welcome again to the Lower Left Podcast from 17th and Island in San Diego's East Village right here at the Lower Left. Um, today's guest is... Uh, Extremely good friend of mine. I've known this dude for years. He's a man. He, he's got all kinds of titles, but he was a, a curator, low rider, historian. He's, uh, yeah. he's worked really closely with Teen Angel. He currently is the head of, uh, Teen Angels and Teen Angel, that, that whole project, that whole legacy. He's got three stories. I'd say he's got his story as, uh, David the Baca. Um, his San Diego he's been cruising the streets of San Diego probably as long as I have. He'll probably say longer, but I'll tell you, probably not. But maybe I don't know. But um, he's a real solid, solid good dude, great friend of mine, and a great friend of Johnny's. We've been some, we've been doing, we've done yeah. some cool shit with David, huh, Johnny? Yeah, I know. Uh, you you, you gave David a lot of titles there. He's got I, a lot of titles. Yeah, he's got I, a lot of titles. I know David as one cool ass dude. Um, That's a good one. Always, uh, Late, I mean, oh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> always a good time to talk to. Actually, uh, a lot of knowledge, a lot of history, and uh, a lot of good times. Yeah, thank they, you. You guys are making me blush. Yeah, well, we'll see it on the camera. <laughs> yeah. But uh, David the Baca, real, real good dude. Um, you know, really into Chicanismo culture, lifestyle, low riding. Um, so welcome to the Lord Left Podcast, David. What's happening? Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Johnny. What's happening with you guys? <laughs> <laughs> We're just right here doing this, doing this thing. So you've got, you've got probably one of the most interesting stories, like for real, not just bullshitting that I've heard in a long time. First time you told me the story regarding Teen Angel, um, aka. And I, you could say his name if you want to, because yeah. I don't know if it's Dave cool. Holland. Dave Holland was his mm. name. Um, David was Teen Angel's only friend for maybe the past how long? How many probably, years of his probably life? Probably like the last ten years of his life. Dave, Dave, or Teen Angel had he was a recluse, and you correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're right. He didn't. He didn't see anybody other than. His wife, pretty much, he wouldn't leave his house. People don't know what he looked like to this day. There's very few, if any, photographs of him. He was uh, reclusive and preferred to be anonymous in, in his in his personal life and in his you know appearance for yeah as forever. an artist yeah as an artist. People didn't know what he what or who he was. I would say. Teen Angel was like Banksy before Banksy. Teen Angel was social media before social media. Teen Angel magazines encourage people to send in photographs of themselves with, you know, everything from dedications to to just people being social through Teen Angel's magazine. What what do you have and this I know this could this could go on for a while and then your relationship with them was was super, super cool. So maybe we could start with how you met him and how you and him became to be such good friends and how how he entrusted you with pretty much his legacy, like everything that he built with his name, his art, and, you know, his his archive. Right. How, how'd that go down? Well, it. I mean, shoot, I'm 55. I know I look like I'm 35. <laughs> Comedian, too, huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 there's another title. <laughs> 
No, and so I think Bobby and I are close in age. So Lowrider Magazine came out probably 1977. I was about 12 years old. And up until Lowrider Magazine came out, even as a, a little morro, I was into low riding. I mean, since I was a kid, since I was little, little. Like, Where, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Paradise Hills in San Diego. So my brothers were into low riders. My dad was into cars. So it was kind of something that it was my life was about. But you know, growing up in the neighborhood I grew in, there was dudes with low riders and my brothers. So since I was eight or nine years old, I was into low riding. So. Even as a kid, like my mom would take me to Long's Drugs with her, and I would just say, hey, uh, I'll be in the magazine section. And I would go through all the hot rod and street rod magazines just looking for a picture of a low rider or a car with white walls or something. Because there there was nothing that catered to the low rider culture. Until 1977, I was in seventh grade, and some kid brought low rider magazine number one to school. And I was like, whoa. I was blown away. I was 12 years old, and here was this actual magazine dedicated to that lifestyle. So I was pumped, man. I, the kid gave me the subscription card, and that day I ran home. And I remember I showed my brother Victor, and you know my mom wrote us a check, and we got a subscription starting at Lowrider Magazine. So when we got our first Lowrider Magazine, inside the magazine there was this artist that was drawing art for Lowrider Magazine, and it was Teen Angel. So that was my first introduction to Teen Angel when I was about 12 years old, seventh grade. And I was into low riding, but my dad and my brothers, uh, my whole family was kind of into art. I mean, so just to, just to clarify something. So Teen Angel was the first like artist that, that was connected to Lowrider Magazine that did the actual Lowrider Magazine Little Vato Icon. I'm not did, sure did if he did that little or... icon or the the actual logo itself, but he was the actual first uh, like uh, employed artist like for Lowrider Magazine, artist. staff artist for Lowrider Magazine. Right. So the the magazine introduced him as their artist, and then he became uh, a regular. Uh, he was actually worked for Lowrider Magazine. Do you know how they connected? Because Lowrider's in San Jose, right? Northern California? Yeah. Well, what happened with Teen Angel, he told me that he sent some art in and he wrote them a couple letters and and they kind of liked his style and they connected with him at the time, I believe. And I could be wrong, but I, I think he was working for the city of Rialto in San Bernardino at the time. And he was actually an artist for the city of Rialto. And... The Writer Magazine offered him a position as a staff member of the Writer Magazine and artist, and he took that. He accepted that position, and at that point, he moved up to I think it was Milpitas, California, up near Northern California, where the Writer Magazine was was oh. based out of, and that's when he be, he started working for them, and then, you know, that's how I started finding out who this guy was. At the time, I was into art. My parents encouraged art. I mean, in our in our family home to this day, there's murals on the walls in, in my old bedroom and inside the garage where my parents just let us kind of have free will in the house. And so I was very much into art, drawing lowriders and, and then into lowriders. So when I saw this Teen Angel character, you know, he kind of went along with my whole vibe, being into art and being into lowriders. So that was my first introduction to him. And then as I grew older, I just kind of stayed it was kind of like a, a cultural thing. If you were a Chicano on the streets and you were uh, about it, you know, in the late seventies, there was low riding. That was where your heart was. And so, uh, Teen Angel was actually, he's like the godfather of low rider art because he was one of the first ones who was actually doing it and making a living doing it. He was getting paid as an artist to draw low riders. And that was a first. That was in the 70s. Before that, nobody had been employed as a, an artist and, and actually was making a living as a lowrider artist. Now you got thousands of them, hundreds of them. And that's when it evolved into him just, you know, having an impact on my life as a kid. Um, and then, uh, you know, as time went on, he became more well known. And then around 1980, uh, he was kind of frustrated with Lowrider Magazine because uh, up until then he did a lot of centerfolds. 
around 1980, uh, Loiter Magazine had struck up some kind of deal with Budweiser, and Budweiser had, according to Teen Angel, told me, he said that Budweiser told them, okay, you know, we're going to sponsor, you know, you know, make regular contributions to the magazine, but we want centerfold advertisement, and we want a real car in there that says, you know, Budweiser, Lowrider of the Month, something like that. So Teen Angel became a little frustrated because he thought, oh, man, now the magazine's pushing alcohol onto the raza, which, you know, they, they don't need the push, but he wasn't about that. So at that time, he had already had a little club going called Teen Angels, where he would encourage youth of the barrio to become members of Teen Angels. And it was just kind of like a, a united Chicano club for young teenagers. And uh, at that time, he decided he was going to start Teen Angels magazine. That was about 1980. And he started the magazine and on his own. And at the time, his two sons were small boys and his wife at the time, they uh, he started producing the magazine and he was it was a... a home project it was like the the original zine of zines you know they have these zine fests now where people put together magazines well teen angel was doing this in his living room with his wife and his two young sons and he'd do all the artwork and type out the articles and then he'd send everything out to get printed and he'd bring it back home and his his wife and kids would sit there stapling the magazine together folding them putting them together and then he would box them up and Teen Angel had trouble finding stores where he could sell the magazine because all these stores thought it was, all these mainstream stores felt it was like uh, gang related or it was Chicano influence, and it was. And so they didn't want to be part of it. So Teen Angel ended up uh, just, you know, doing the distribution himself to mom and pop stores, liquor stores all throughout California. And he actually did the distribution himself where he would drive up and down the coast. And all throughout California, maybe head over to Arizona, just with a van full of boxes of magazines and delivering them. Was that them. how they were delivered the whole life of Teen Angel magazine? Like, was that? Yes. So he always. From you, the beginning. From the beginning. So mm -hmm. his family put it together mm -hmm. and then he would distribute them himself. He yeah. Would, he would pull up to the stores and unload the magazines. And, and a lot of these people, if I remember correctly, what you told me, a lot of these people didn't know that it was actually him. Yeah, because he he would pull up in these neighborhoods, and uh, I know you would see it, Bobby, in liquor stores when you were yeah. growing up, and I don't know about you, Johnny, but it was all in these little mom and pop stores. Yeah. But Teen Angel would, would actually deliver the magazine, and he told me a story where he would deliver magazines, and then he would hang out because he would watch the kids from the Vario come and buy the magazine, and he just wanted to see them, the look on their face and stuff as they read the magazine. But Teen Angel was so kind of down low, he never used his real name. Uh, he was a white guy. He was born in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. And uh, he never really wanted to put himself out there as this artist. That's why he always used the name Teen Angel. And when you see any artwork done by Teen Angel, you'll never see his real name, Dave Holland, because he was kind of this underground kind of dude. But there are pieces that you have that I've seen that... I, I and and I don't know if we came up with this together or how this happened, but if Norman Rockwell painted Main Street America Americana, then Teen Angel painted and drew the back streets. That's correct. The neighborhoods, the yeah. barrios, the alleys, like mm -hmm. the shit that was going on. It's also Americana, but it's from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. It's some of it's from the same time period or different time periods, but Going back to what I was originally saying is there's also pieces that you have that look very, very like wholesome, um, wholesome. Uh -huh. and, and the trolley cars from the 20s or 30s in, in uh -huh. L.A. or and things that, that have nothing yeah. to do with Chicanismo. So yeah. he he had a perspective of he kind of um, had dual personalities. Yeah. You man. know, Dave Holland painted this kind of Americana art. And Teen Angel painted this backstreet Chicano and, art, and, and some of them were like military-ish, right? There yeah, was like the... he was very. He was in the army. He was in the Korean War, so a lot of his artwork that he signed as Dave Holland was more like military type artwork, uh, airplanes, ships, that kind of thing. I have artwork of Teen Angels dating back to the 1940s. Wow. 
he was born in 1939, but he started drawing when he was four or five years old. And fortunately, his mom held on to all that artwork. Um, but like, I, you know, as we were saying at the liquor stores, he would deliver this stuff, not to get off topic. And then he told me stories where he'd buy like a little a little bottle of tequila and he'd kick back in front of the liquor store and drink his tequila and smoke a cigarette and watch the little Chicanitos from the hood reading the magazines and pointing at people. Oh, there's what's his name. And oh, check out this piece of art. And he'd be sitting there, you know, taking a few shots, smoking a cigarette, just enjoying the, the feeling that he was bringing to these youngsters. Because like Bobby said, there was no social media at that time. The only outreach, if you grew up in a neighborhood, because most of the time you didn't have the means to get outside of that neighborhood. Your parents didn't have a lot of money, so you weren't traveling to other cities. But a way to see what was happening in other neighborhoods and other radios and other states and other cities was through Teen Angels magazine. It was the, the Chicano social media of the time. There was a dedication section. There was art sections. There was articles. There was lowrider sections. So... Unlike Lowrider Magazine, Teen Angel's uh, idea with with his magazine was to promote the whole Chicano Vario lifestyle. It was interactive. Yeah. From, People were interacting yeah. with each other. A lot of dudes that were locked up would send, send artwork, in. artwork uh-huh. and their address and hoping that, to get somebody to write yeah. them back. And, you know, they would they there, would kind of put themselves out there hoping to get some, some interactions. Yeah, there was a pen pal section. There was an art section. There was lowrider sections. There was like clothing style sections, hairstyles. So he was kind of promoting the whole Chicano lifestyle where, where main, mainstream America at the time looked down upon Chicanos. Teen Angels saw the beauty in lowriders. He, was, he saw he the beauty like in graffiti a, in, in, the, in, the, in the clothing style. He, he saw the beauty in the life, whole student. lifestyle. And, and very observant because it's, it, when you look at these drawings, anybody that's into style or, or the dress of the, that period and the, the way the homeboys dressed or the way that the cars were built, there's a lot of details that if they're not done right, people will be like, ah, this fucking guy, stop bothering. He don't know what the fuck right. he's doing. You know what I mean? But he nailed it. He, he dialed it in. He knew the characters, the stance, the shoes, the pants, the shirts, the, the way that the bandana was worn. And then the cars, the type of rims, you know, the white walls, the grills, all the accessories, the things that, that pertain to the culture. There's a shit ton of details, excuse me, that had to be intact in order to have that credibility. And, and he, you know, that no one did it like he did it. And then besides that um going you know i seen him he he would venture off into this americana stuff right or i seen some magazines some things he used to do with 18 wheelers yeah big and it's big the rigs. same thing like in order to do that you got to know which 18 wheeler which truck which right. accessory which rim what what type of you know whatever it is that i don't know shit about 18 wheelers but this dude he was able to put together a whole magazine or magazines uh-huh. based on 18 wheelers. So besides just the Teen Angels magazines, I, I know that there were several others that, that he did that are extremely rare. Can you talk about that a minute? Yeah, there was, uh, in addition to Teen Angels magazines, what happened is he, uh, Teen Angel was a man, he was kind of an obsessive artist. So he wasn't, really uh he was never about self promotion he was just couldn't control himself from creating art so he diverted into not only teen angels magazine but then he started doing a magazine he did a magazine called corazon that's the one that bobby was talking about he did probably about 12 issues of corazon and that was a a, a magazine all focused on the chicano trucking industry in california cuz you know most truckers or a lot of truckers are Chicanos. And so he did this magazine dedicated to that lifestyle. And he would kind of do up the magazine, the trucks kind of like a uh, low rider style. Yeah. So Teen Angel did several other magazines. Uh, the magazine that Bobby was referring to was called Corazon. And he probably did about 10 or 12 issues. And that was a magazine that was geared towards the Chicano trucker. And as we all know, there's a lot of uh, 
Chicanos that are into the trucking industry. So he did this whole magazine where the trucks were all kind of low rided out with big gangster white walls and fender skirts and everything. In addition to that, he did Green Angels magazine, which was geared towards Chicanos or that were in the military. Um, oh, I didn't know that. I yeah. didn't either. Do you have any of those? Yeah. How he many did, did he do? He only did two issues of Green Angels. But uh, guys from that were across the country or in other countries or would send in their photos of, you know, guys in the Marines and they would be like so-and-so from this neighborhood and so-and-so from this neighborhood. And you'd see these vatos, you know, with their hands, you know, held together and post holding up the U.S. Marine flag, but being down for the raza, but at the same time being uh, members of the military. So that was called Green Angels. And then he did another magazine called La Bandera, and that was kind of geared towards, like, Mexican history. You know, Zapata, uh, Aztec culture, that kind of thing. So he would tell stories about the the history of of Mexico and the influence that it has on the raza. So he did just all kinds of different magazines. did, like, Gangster Girls, too, right? Gangster Girls. That was a one-off magazine, and then Classic Style Bombs and Babes. So Teen Angel was obsessed. He was an obsessive artist, and it, he was never really doing it to promote himself, but he wanted to. He he loved art. He loved the Chicano lifestyle. He loved low riding, uh, and he wanted to promote that. When he was doing Teen Angel's magazine, it got a little overwhelming for him, for him. and that's when um, – a lot of guys that were locked up in the in the prison started sending in their artwork because they they saw this Chicano vibe of this magazine, and there was pen pals and photos. They started sending in photos, dedications, but a lot of them sent in artwork. And then Teen Angel started using this artwork in the magazine. So a lot of the artwork that these guys in prison sent in became cover art. And at that time, it became a, a Teen Angel collaboration with this artist because. They were probably sending in a pen and ink drawing uh, because they didn't have access to a lot of colors uh, to draw with. And then Teenager would come in with markers or watercolors or different types of paint and color their artwork in. And then he'd add the Teen Angel magazine logo to it. And most of, more often than not, there was like a... Um, a frame of roses around the artwork. So they became collaborations of... Teen Angel and this artist from from prison. But it was all about just spreading the the culture, spreading the vibe. If you notice a lot of Teen Angel's artwork, he would do like these cholo scenes or lowrider scenes, and and they had these kind of cartoon-like figures that he called them the the bubblehead figures because uh, he wanted to kind of promote a happiness you know, and he wanted to show everybody, ha- you know, being happy and that and it was a good time too. It was it a good time. It was yeah. positive, and he, he wasn't yeah. trying to bring out the the negativity and things like that. That, yeah. that there was like a lot of positive vibes around it, and yeah, and shit like that. And 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 my goal as I as I became friends with Teen Angel, and and back in two thousand five is when I curated the first exhibit that I did. And at the time, there was there was none of these Chicano art galleries. There was no museums weren't you know. Giving. Which show was that? Was that the one that on the was, central? Oh, yeah, that the was automotive museum. San Diego Automotive, automotive museum. museum. Yeah. And and uh, the show was called Bajitos y Suavecitos. I didn't name it. the The museum itself named it, but they reached out to me to get get them some lowriders. And at the time, I had always had this vision of putting together a show that included art and lowriders and memorabilia so i saw it as an opportunity and i told the museum that i would i would help them get some cars but i kind of asked them hey let me curate the show i had never did it before but i had a vision since i was young of putting together a show like that and so um bobby was there and and bobby i reached out to bobby for some help but that's when i first started curating and that's when i uh, kind of started looking for Teen Angel because after, that show was was real successful for the San Diego Automotive Museum and it was their highest attending show at the time because I told them I said hey man let's you know you guys most of your visitors are probably people that are on vacation I said but I want to do a show that's going to appeal 
not just to people on vacation coming through. I, I want to do a show that will appeal to local people from San Diego because I knew a lot of people in the Chicano community at that time had never even been in a museum. And I wanted to do a show in a museum. So that show went over real well. And uh, after that, uh, Oceanside Museum of Art reached out to me and they wanted me to curate an exhibit in their museum. And that's when I kind of started. Uh, I was I had about two years and I was on this mission to find Teen Angel because now I had this platform where I could, you know, display his work. And at the time, there was still there still was no really gallery outlets for Chicano. This was in the mid 2000s and there was no museum exhibits happening. So I kind of felt like I was at the forefront for bringing these Chicano slash lowrider exhibits, you know, to the community. I know Peterson Automotive Museum had a couple, had they had done one before the one I did at Automotive Museum, but it gave me an opportunity. And so uh, I just happened to be, I'm into all kinds of art. I happened to be at this train show and there was a, a guy selling calendars of, of these train, this train art. It was like this Americana art, but I was walking by this, sh- this table and I saw the art and right away in my head, I said, man, that looks like teenage art. I seen these bubblehead people and trains and it was kind of wholesome, but it was like, you know, kind of like Americana art, but had his it, style. Yeah. It had his style. I was so into him since I was young, I could recognize his style. So I asked the guy, I said, man, and and it had a white guy's name there, Dave Hall. And I said, man, if it didn't have a white dude's name here on your artwork, I said, I swear this is Teen Angel. And the guy said, man, that is Teen Angel. Teen Angel is my stepdad. I said, what? So that kind of, you know, I started. You Who know, was that? That, that, which, that was his stepson. Which son was that? That was his son. Uh, it was his, his wife at the time. Oh, okay. Uh, her name is Coco. Uh-huh. And that was his wife. You know, up until he passed, but that was her son. Where was this train show at? It was up in Riverside. And you just randomly went to a train show in Riverside. Well, because I've been to all kinds of art, uh-huh. and it was like an art show, and I was having to be up there, and I saw something that there was some show happening, and I said, "Man, I'm going to check this out." And um, this kid happened to be selling this, you know, calendars and and these train books, coloring books. I was like, "Man, I was tripping out." And so I was just kind of on my own little vibe. I would go on, you know, do this stuff by myself and just just because I was always trying to soak up art. And that's kind of how I met Teen Angel. And basically the guy tripped out because I knew so much about Teen Angel and I was telling him all kinds of stuff. And he said, man, you know, he doesn't have a, a computer or anything, but I'll give you his address. You could write him a letter or, you know, I'll give him his, you, his phone number and you can give him a call. And about two weeks later, I called him, and, and Teen Angel was madder than a wet hornet, man. He said, man, my stepson told me you'd be calling, and you know he fucked up. He should have never gave you my phone number. And I said, I apologize, and he said, man, I prefer not to talk to nobody. You know, this is like the life I've chosen, and I don't like anybody calling me and basically lose my number. And, and at the time, he told me, you know, I don't even leave my house, he said, but... Uh, I wish I would leave my house because I'd like to buy a 37 Chevy model because he built model cars too. He said, but I won't even do that. I won't even leave my house for that. Well, him and I hung up and I had his address because his stepson had gave it to me. So I went in my garage because I collect model cars and I grabbed a 37 Chevy model convertible out of my oh, collection and I just put it in a box and, and, and wrote a heartfelt letter about how much he contributed to the Chicano community and how appreciative I was and the influence it had on me. It was a heartfelt letter. And I just sent it to him and, and I said, this was just a little token of my gratitude. I never expected to hear from him again. And probably a week after that, I received a, a FedEx package in the mail with an original piece of art and some magazines and a letter. And he basically said he was so touched by my letter that I was free to call whenever I wanted. And that became began, that was the, the beginning of our friendship. What, what year was this? That was uh, probably 
2007, somewhere around there. So he went from totally being anti, you know, talk to anybody, especially probably maybe about Teen Angel, um, since he's doing like the um, the calendar that his stepson's selling, to opening up to you. Yeah, and and we became friends, and it and but it was just a phone friendship. I would call him about once a week, and we would rap, and 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 basically we just were connecting, you know, about artwork about low riding and he had been into low riders since you know the the 1940s late 1940s i have drawings of his from 1949 where he was drawing 37 chevys laid out on big white walls and skirts and venetian blinds in the back windows and big antennas with foxtails so he was drawing this stuff when he was a little kid so him and i would talk about you know cars and how it influenced him and he started telling me stories and we just became real connected and it wasn't until about a year after that he invited me up to his house to actually meet him in person he was living in san bernardino uh up there off baseline and i went up there to his house and it was a big deal man when i got there him and his wife were wearing cowboy hats and the same shirt and the big belt buckles and they oh, were shit. dressed they were dressed alike they were dressed up to receive you yeah and then I, I i walked in and he said man i bet i don't look anything you expected me to look like huh and i was like no he looked like a biker you know he had long hair and a long beard that's, that's a trip because anytime you mention teen angel everybody thinks that he's just like an old homeboy an old bet that well, even or, me yeah a quadruple yeah. g type dude like before, that's that's who we're expecting before i met him in my mind i always pictured this old vet that i know you know and yeah uh you know, up until then, I, you know, after reading all his stories as a kid, I thought it was this old, you know, gangster veterano guy. And he was just an old, old white dude. But he was so heavily into the culture that, you know, he had studied the culture so much and he was so engulfed in the culture and it was in his heart. You know, low riding was in his heart. Chicanismo was in his heart. And so no matter what he was born you know he was his mom was a teacher and his dad was in the navy so he had all the makings to become you know joe american but his his american dream was to be a chicano and that's the lifestyle he was living what was it like that first visit oh man it was like it was to me it was you know everybody has you know different idols or whatever but since i was into this guy since i was a kid it was like, you know, meeting somebody that you've always admired or looked up to, you know, some people look up to uh, musicians or movie stars. And since I was into art and, and lowriders, this was somebody I looked up to. So it was like real rewarding for me just to be able to be in his presence. Did and, he show you like his, I guess, his archives? His, his No, art? man. At, in the beginning, he told me he had nothing. He had no art. And so... He said, man, I don't have anything. I got everything I had, I got rid of. And him and I, I started visiting him about once a month. And I'd get there early in the morning and I'd hang out. You know, I'd be thinking I I was going to be home by six or seven that night. And I'd stay till 10, 11 at night. So we'd spend the whole day, eat lunch, eat dinner, just rapping about art. And uh, what I started doing was I started taking Teen Angel magazines from my collection up to his pad and he was kind of going blind at the time, so he couldn't see well. And I would just read stories and I would ask him questions. Hey, what was going on here? Why'd you draw this? Or, you know, why, you know, why, why does this magazine have this in did it? Did you document any of that stuff? Any of I, those responses? Yeah. So what happened was, uh, he was older, you know, he was in his seventies. And I said, man, and he was, his health was deteriorating. So I, I told him, I said, it was important that we, document his his life and because even him he didn't have a computer he didn't really know the impact that he was making on the culture and i mean i felt that it was important to educate the culture about teen angels because there is artists there's tattoo artists who are doing teen angel style art they're actually, you know, Googling images and pulling images off the computer that were images that maybe some guy in prison sent into Teen Angels magazine or Teen Angels cover art. And these guys are tattooing this on other people, but they don't even know the history of where this stuff's coming from. So I thought it was important for me to 
educate the Rasa, and especially some of the younger tattoo artists and younger artists as to where this whole lifestyle came from. And it's important that, you know, if people are going to be about it, that they know about it, where it came from. And, and that kind of became my mission with him. And I, I expressed to him that we needed to really, you know, start documenting his lifestyle. So I started taking notes. And then I started uh, voice recording him. He didn't like pictures at all. He didn't want any photos or video. I know somebody who's like that. <laughs> yeah. Bobby Schreibel. <laughs> A little bit. But, uh, um, you know, it's also it's also good, like you said, for people to know the history and all that and, and where certain images or styles come from. Um, but also hit the aspect of putting together a magazine. I mean, you were saying that he was, you know, doing the art getting it pr produced actually state having his family staple it and then driving it out to probably from the san jose oakland to san diego you know yeah. um by himself like right. that if he hadn't done all that like who knows if we would have had the ability to be exposed to that kind of um he was passionate his art. Like yeah that was that was his shit how many magazine teen angel magazines do you think he did or how many did he do here's two questions how many did he do and what are those worth now? Because I've right. seen some shit like issues one to, you know, which the, the, the big money issues are. So Yeah, I think there's, man, to be exact, I can't be exact, but I think there was about 200 and 30, 230, issues? 234 issues. That's a lot. And he made them all? Um, no, he actually did the magazine up until the 90s. Uh -huh. And at that point, he passed the magazine over to his son, Johnny. And his son, Johnny, did the magazine in the 90s. And Johnny was, you know, Johnny was younger, so he kind of modernized the magazine. And, you know, he got more into the computer technology, so Johnny was putting it together. And it was a little bit more professionally done. It wasn't as crude Cut and as, paste. as Teen, Angel. Teen Angel never even had a computer, so... Teen Angel's idea of a drawing and shrinking it down to fit a piece of paper was taking it to a copy machine and reducing it. You know, he didn't have the ability to scan things. So up, I think Teen Angel did uh, up through and up through the high 100s, and then uh, Johnny took over. So that's and, a good good chunk of it. Of yeah, the and some. then even during the time when his son Johnny was doing the magazine, Teen Angel was contributing. Teen Angel would. He was blasting out on artwork. He would do these bad pieces and then give them to his son, and his son would use, use them as centerfolds and that kind of thing. So what are what are they worth? Well, I've seen, you know, like issues one and two. I think the most I see those sell for is probably about $600. You know, maybe I see some listed as much as $1,000, $1,500. I know um, I've sold particular magazines for as much as – six and seven hundred dollars so the magazines get pretty pricey uh, fortunately for me i took my collection on one of my visits to teen angel and i just had him sign the cover of all of them and i mean teen angel we genuinely just became just these good friends where we would just laugh our asses off and you know we'd have a couple of drinks and and Talk i was shit. i was just basically soaking up his knowledge and he was kind of schooling me um, and we were friends for over a year until one day, a, like I say, he had told me he had no more art. And one day, uh, he had, a, he lived in this little tiny pad in San Bernardino and a uh, little tiny living room, smaller, well, probably about the size of where we're at right now. And then he said, man, I'm tired. I need to crash out. And I said, all right, man, I'm going to, it was about six o'clock in the evening. I said, I'm going to get going, man. I'm going to head back to San Diego. And he said, no, 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 I want you to be here when I wake up, man. I said, okay, cool. I'll just kick it here and watch TV while you, you know, take a little snooze. And he said, no. He said, you know, if you go down the hall right there next to the bathroom, there's a door into a room. He said, just go hang out in that room until I wake up. I said, cool. So he closed his eyes and he was going to take a little nap. And I walked in. And up until this point, I thought he had no artwork. You know, it was a, a year into our friendship at least. And I opened that door into that room and it was like in the movies where you see, you know, like they discover gold <laughs> and then like this bright gold light came out of me. Yeah. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, I see there was just 
boxes full of artwork. There was stuff on the walls. There were shelves. It was like the room was just packed with art. And I was like, man, I felt like Chicano Picker at that time. I was like, it's on and shit. I got on my knees and started pulling out boxes from under tables. And all, I started seeing artwork that was featured back in Lowrider Magazine in the 1980s. And here I'm holding the original piece and it's just laying in this box. So I was like pumped, man. And he must have slept for an hour or two. And I, when I came out, I was like all oh, fucking big eyed and all happy. I was like, man, you've been holding out. And I think in a way he was just testing the friendship and he saw me as a genuine friend. And, and that's when he wanted to kind of like just let me into more of his world. And it was, you know, it was heartfelt to me because I saw what he was doing. People had, you know, tried to take advantage of him for years. Um, but that time I came out with one piece, a bad 63 Impala in a parade. And I was like, man, teen angel, man, look, man, you've been holding out. I said, man, what's it going to take for me to take this home? And he said, man, well, how much you give me? So I made him an offer and I said, man, I, I can't give you what it's worth, but you know, I, this is what I have on me. And he took it and that was the first piece I got from him. And he signed the back of that piece and he wrote uh, to David DeBaca, my best friend, you know. Uh, much respect, Teen Angel. And I was like, man, when I but had he, that thing framed. He didn't have any friends. Like, you were no. his only friend. You were, <laughs> he was, and you. who else was he speaking to during that time period besides you and his wife? Just me and his wife, basically. You know, and his wife only spoke Spanish. And so she was from Mexico. She had a hard time relating to the whole Chicano culture and lowrider culture. So I was kind of his outlet, man. We would talk about cars and uh, you know, low riding. And so him and I would just kind of chuck and jive about what was happening and how cars are done and how they should be done. So I was kind of uh, his outlet to, you know, knowing what was happening outside because he was a recluse. He was an artist. You know, a lot of artists are eccentric. Everybody knows that. And he was an eccentric, reclusive artist. And that was just him. His son told me, uh, his son David Bayaso told me that he remembers when he was a little kid and Teen Angel would just be drawing art, 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 art. And he had, he would like be in his boxers and a t-shirt in his art room just drawing all day. And, and Bayaso told me that he had a pair of jeans by the door in case somebody knocked at the door. He'd go put on the jeans, <laughs> open the door, like, what do you want? You know, okay, bye, hang, close the door. Or, or he told me if the family was having a carne asada, they would almost have to, you know, they'd say, hey, the food's ready. He said, teenage would come out, eat a plate, spend, you know, 30 minutes with the family and then go back in and just banging out art. Because he was just, even when I met him, when I'd get to his house, you know, his couch, he had a couch and there was paint on the arm of the couch because he'd just have his paintbrushes right there and he'd be wiping them on the edge of the couch and he'd be... He was painting, he was doing all this kind of like uh, military art at the time. And he was making these big ships. He was actually making these three-dimensional ships. Some of them were like four or five feet long and they were all handmade. And he was painting all the little figures and he was just obsessive about it. And to me, it was, it was interesting watching, you know, him as a, as a man. I knew him as, as an artist, this artwork that I knew when I was a kid, but actually seeing the man who created it and how it was how it was happening in front of me man dude like so i know that you would go up there quite a bit and spend spend a, a ton of time with this dude like what what do you think uh some of the best lessons this dude taught you were like what did you what do you think you really took away from this relationship Besides just knowing, knowing about him and his art, and and kind of digging into it, like what what do you value most about that time you were able to spend with him? The thing I value, I think, is that Teen Angel was a. It, it's a lot of people now. It's especially with like the Instagram world and social media. It's a it's a lot of self promotion going on, and. Uh, Bobby and I t have this conversation regularly where we talk about how there's all these people out there in the social media world that they they want so bad to be somebody, you know, they want to call themselves an artist and 
they start promoting themselves as artists, even though their art might lack a little in quality. They, or a lot. <laughs> or a lot, <laughs> as Bobby and I talk about. They still want to be part of this culture or they want to start a clothing line and they want to be an artist. Or, you know, there's so many people that are so about self-promoting and they want to belong to something. And, and with Teen Angel, I realized that as good of an artist as he was and the impact he had on Chicano and lowrider art history, as much of an impact he had, that that wasn't what he lived for. That wasn't what he was about. What was it, what it was about was his artwork and promoting this positive lifestyle for people. So he just kind of wanted to spread that positivity among the raza. And that, so I, I got that out of that relationship for him. Like, man, it, it doesn't matter who knows you or what they know you for. That's not what you're contributing to this, you know, world when you're gone. You know, that's not how to leave a legacy. So um, that's another thing I thought was important about educating, you know, these people who are kind of following in his footsteps that understand that this is the guy that laid the foundation for you. He was ridiculed and put down by mainstream America for the artwork he was doing. And now you're doing it, making a living. Well, have the respect to know where it came from and and respect that, you know, the foundation of, of where the artwork, where that lifestyle came from. I mean, Teen Angel was doing uh, tattoo flash books back, you know, in the 80s that were just all Chicano influence based. And now people are doing that stuff and making a living doing it. And they're not real. They're just, you know, it's so accepted now. You know, you got firemen, judges, doctors who are full sleeved. And 30 years ago, you never saw that, man. If you were full sleeved, that was something you earned when you were locked up. And it was now, a statement. Yeah. It was like a, a rite of passage. And now people have been given this pass to just, you know, a free will. And it's cool because, you know, it's, 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 it's a, a beautiful thing that our rasa kind of sp spread or started the black and gray tattoo style. But, you know, just understand where it came from and respect that past. I think it, in regards to just the culture, like low riding, Chicano culture, um, just, you know, things that were happening on the streets during that time period from the 70s, 80s and, and early 90s. That was the go to. He is that dude. Like you said, people were tattooing his artwork. They were able to see what was going on in the prison systems in regards to the artwork and the, you know, the, the black and gray pencil drawings and, and things that were coming out of there. So, like you said, there was a lot of his work that was being tattooed. And I think a lot of, you know, these OG tattooers will tell you the same thing, how inspired they were by Teen Angel as, as one of the, godfathers or icons of not just Ch chicano art um style culture but um media you know the 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 media besides just lowrider magazine yeah lowrider magazine you know changed a lot and and it became more corporate and they brought in corporate sponsors and if I'm understanding you correctly, that's one of the reasons that he didn't want to stay down with it and move on. But he kept it at a street level. Right. And not just that. He kept it genuine by not just producing the magazine himself and sometimes very crudely. Like I've seen some of the, you know, obviously you've got an amazing, amazing collection. Um, seeing a lot of cut and paste stuff. Yeah. You know, things where he would cut and paste and reduce and then cut and paste again and then take this from this and add this to this and change this to make this completely different. Yeah. And all this thing turning into these, the amount of work that was involved, not just in producing the magazine, but gathering content, producing the magazine, assembling the magazine, distributing the magazine, and then having the passion to go out and do it all over again for, you know, the high hundreds, close to 200 times is fucking right. amazing. You know, and then for him not to really want, and it's understandable, you know, to me or to a lot of people, it's understandable to want people to know 
your artwork, want want to know your accomplishments in regards to your art. And for him, it was it was a magazine. It was design. It was style, but not as a person, really. Right. You know, they not as, you know, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me, you know, but no, this is I'm representing a little bit something different. It's something greater than just myself. Right. You know, maybe that was kind of where his head was like this. This isn't just about, you know, Dave Holland or Teen Angel. Right. This is about a culture, a lifestyle, something mm-hmm. that goes way beyond just me. And and I understand that. You know, yeah. I, I think it's, it's it's credible, it's classy, and it's a uh, it's a beautiful thing, man. And and like I said, the the relationship, the, the story that you have, and you know, we've been in talks, and you know, you've done a couple books already, and there's we've been in some meetings, and you've been in some meetings, and there's people that are talking about a documentary, and I think it would make a fucking insane movie, and not just because of you. Not just because of of Dave Holland, Teen Angel, but because of that relationship that you had with him. So there's two amazing stories there. Right. Because I I know you took it to his death. And I remember while he was passing and he was going through it, you practically lived up there with them. Right. And you were there the whole time. And that he kind of spoke to you even even after he passed. Yeah. It, there was it, there was some trippy shit that happened. Um, do you want to talk about that? Or, um, you don't have to if you yeah, don't want to. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll tell one story. But there was several times, you know, as he was getting close to passing and after he passed where things would happen to me in dreams and, and stuff. And I would call him the next day and it was a trip because what was happening in my mind, in my dream, was actually happening in his life. And he would tell me stuff or his wife would tell me. But after he did pass, um, I was there the day the day before he passed, and then uh, I, I knew it was getting close. And then I came home, and the next day his wife called me, and he she said, "Hey, uh, Dave passed today." So I think it was a Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. So I said, "Okay, I'm going to shoot up there." So I, I drove up there. It was about a two hour drive from San Diego to San Bernardino, and the last couple months before his death, he was in hospice care. So when you're in hospice care, they bring this kind of hospital bed to your home. And that art room where I tell you I had, he had first, that time he let me into that room, he had, they had put the hospice bed in, in that art room at an angle. So he was surrounded with all his artwork and there was these shelves with all these ships and trains and artwork and, his art desk was there with, you know, his paintwork, and he would make these kind of um, like Adelita dolls. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what to what to call them. Yeah, because they're, they're like, like little monitos. Like but little they're, monitos. They're kind of. It's not. It's like out of. Uh, it's not cardboard. It's like hardboard. Yeah, but it's like more a, board than yeah. cardboard. And there was all these figures around him, man. And that bed was, and there was a big ship. I mean, he would lay in that bed, and that ship went across his face like this. So he was just surrounded with his artwork. So I got up there when he passed, and uh, it was a trip because I thought it would, you know, I was, just, you know, I was, I was sad, and and I was emotional and I was going through it but by the same token I was still thinking about preserving the history of Teen Angel so uh, the day he passed I, I asked his wife I said hey I think it's really important that we document his space because up until then Teen Angel let me never let me bring another person to his home I know we tried you tried to yeah. take me up there I, I asked Bob I asked Teen Angel once hey man it would be cool if I bring a friend up here to me he, man he would just about tear my head off anytime I asked him to bring somebody <laughs> around so he's like man I fucking told you I don't want nobody around here man you and me are friends but man fuck everybody else I don't want nobody around <laughs> so he just didn't want you know, at, at the time, I was like, man, it's important that people know who you are and see you and, and really know who you are. And he's like, no, man, you know who I am. You carry that forward. And I don't need to, you know, deal with nobody. So when he passed, I called, I went up there and I told his wife, I think it's important we document his art workspace, his home lifestyle. And I said, are you okay if I bring a photographer in here tomorrow? 
and um, photograph, you know, the, you know, the home here and his art studio and all that. And she was like, cool. She was all about it. Coco was super cool. And she knew what the importance of it. So uh, I got on the horn with Esteban Oriol and I said, hey, Esteban, a teen angel just passed and I want to document his art space, man. Can you shoot over to San Bernardino tomorrow and, and, and take some pictures? And Esteban said, man, I have an appointment at three in LA. So I got to be out of there by one, but yeah, man, I'll meet you at 10 and I'll do it quick and I'll get out of there. Well, the, that night I, they hospice where the company comes, they take that bed away and I was going to stay there overnight at his house. And, and I told his wife, I'll just sleep here on the couch, but I was straightening out his room and it was about one or two in the morning. And, and I, I step on was coming. So I was just kind of putting his desk in order and putting things back in order after we got the hospital bed out of there. And I was sitting in the, his art studio room and I was just kind of soaking it in and going through a, a mental moment of my own, you know, just kind of reminiscing about my relationship with him as a friend and, and our past. And I was really uh, kind of uh, at peace, you know. I was in his this art space and I was looking at all the art and I was sitting in his chair that he sat in. Is that the one that you have here? Yeah, that's the chair I have in my office here and I have his desk here in my office. And then uh, in my head, I, I said, like, man, what do you think? What do you think, Dave? Man, how's it looking here? Because, you know, I got my, my homie coming you through here. You were thinking this. Yeah. And I, I was thinking, what do you think, man? I got, you know, I got my homie coming through here to take some pictures of mine. How's it look? And, man, uh, when I thought that in my head, there was this, he had created this, like, kind of soldier figure. And it was on a shelf and man, that thing f flew off at me <laughs> about three feet and landed at my feet, man. Like someone threw it at you. Yeah. Like right when you were thinking that? Yeah. Like so you asked knocked. him a question in your head. Yeah. And then he answered by, yeah. Know, something like that. Yeah. Thing. And I think I might have wasted, you know, I might have said it out loud. But it like, didn't just said, fall. It no, looked like it was no, thrown. No, it didn't fall straight down. It was like somebody flicked it. And, and I might have probably, you know, said it aloud, like, what do you think, man? Like, I was kind of like just chucking and jiving with myself the way him and I used to. And that thing flipped off the wall. I was like, man. And at first, you know, like the first 10 seconds, I had like fear, like, what the hell? And then I said, oh, man, all right, you don't want this thing here. <laughs> Let's put it over here on your desk. And I just picked up that soldier and set it on the desk. But there were several uh things that happened, you know, kind of interaction between him and I after he passed. Did, but that did, was the first one. Did that freak you out? or No, it, initially it freaked me out. I was like, man, what's up, man? And then, uh, but then I, I you know. You realize I, who it is. Yeah, I realized, cool. you know, like maybe there is some, ha there's yeah. some connection here that's going on that, you know, because you hear stories like that, but I never, I've never been into that stuff, but I was like. At the at that moment, I felt like he was communicating with me. I was like, "All right," and I just took it in stride, and I just said, "You don't want this guy on that shelf. Let's put him on the desk." And then, you know, and I just kind of just kept going about my life. I, I thought about it, and I thought how cool that was. And then the next day, Esteban showed up at the house, and Esteban had told me, "Hey, man, I got to get in and out there." But the cool thing was, man, Esteban was so became so engulfed in taking photos there. He was so tripped out on the house and the way it was laid out and that Esteban was, you know, he was like on the floor taking pictures and he was doing all this. And Esteban had told me he had to be out of there by one and it was three o'clock and he was still there. And he was like, oh man, don't even worry about it, man. You know, I, I got to take advantage of this. And I felt like it was important, you know, that Teen Angel was such an iconic figure in our in our life as Chicanos, as lowriders, and that I thought it was important to have somebody like Esteban document that life, that lifestyle. And, and Esteban has a lot of credibility and a lot of respect in the culture. And, and I thought it was it would go hand in hand to have Esteban photograph that space. So I know that because you know, obviously, you invited me to a very real humble. Um, service when you know his his funeral at, at the church there and it was very very humble very small mm -hmm. quaint just just you know maybe what there was like 
at the most maybe 50 people. I think there was 40 people, yeah, at yeah. the services. So, um, you know, that after he passed, um, he must have really taken and respected you enough to leave you as the, I don't know the right word, the executor or, or yeah, the, the in charge of his legacy, in charge of his name, in charge of Teen Angel um, as a as a brand, um, just everything that he had that had to do with Teen Angel and his name and his legacy. I know that we've done a couple projects together through starting with the legacy show. Um, you know, we did, that was, that was, that was like a year after he died. I think we did legacy one or was that, that was legacy one, right? That was 2015. That was the year he died. That was probably about five or six months after yeah. he passed. And his, and, and his wife came and I'm mm -hmm. not sure if his sons made it there or not, but that you, you and a couple people helped you with that. I know Tim Hendricks helped you and I think Chuko helped you a bit. And, Tim Hendricks and Chuko Moreno. Yeah. Yeah. Those, yeah. those dudes, um, shout out to both those dudes helped you, helped you with that. And it was an amazing show. And then, um, besides legacy, you know, we, obviously we've done a couple of tribal collabs and I know you just got, you, you've been working on some projects with, uh, with born and raised and, and things like that. But what do you, where do you want to take it? Like, what do you want to do? Like, what, what do you think? And I know you're very particular about who you, who you work with and who that name is attached to and rightfully so, because it is so iconic and legendary and it needs to be protected in case. Not just in case, but because it is what it is, obviously it needs to be protected and respected and, and placed properly. But with it regards to, you know, I, like I said, it, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing story, um, about it, you know, uh, not, and it's a multicultural story. It's, it's a guy from where was he born? Uh, Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Yeah. Fucking. I can't, I can't even say Lord, whatever. So he was born in Indiana and he had this love for a white dude, knew everything about Chicano culture, served, um, in the military and then came back and served the people of the neighborhoods and, and the barrios and, and, and shared culture and, and had, you know, a great love for it. And then the relationship that you have with him and so on and so forth. So, you know, a movie. Like mm -hmm. that that's very much needed, I think, if it's done properly, like something something yeah, like and, that. And or, was, or what do you what do you see? What do you want to do with that? Well, it was something that uh Teen Angel and myself talked about before he passed. And that was that uh because when when I had befriended him and we, we became these close friends, one he wasn't doing magazines anymore and he had told me, he said, Hey uh Let's do a magazine, man. Let's do it. You know, I got a bunch of new artwork here. Let's let's put together another magazine. And and, and I said, man, teenager, you've done over three hundred magazines in your life. I said, um, it's time to tell people your story, man. Let's tell people who teenager is, man. Now's the time. And he said, man, you know, I pumped him up because, and he would always say, man, you got great ideas, you got great vision. And I said, man, let's tell them who you are. Let's Let's tell them who Teen Angel is, not just Teen Angel, the lowrider artist, but let's tell them who Teen Angel, the, the train artist is and the military artist. Let's tell them about your whole life. I said, because you have an important place in lowrider art history, in Chicano art history, and people need to know that. I said, nobody really knows who you are. I know who you are, but you've never talked about yourself to anybody else i said let's tell your story so he was he agreed that it was a good idea and he he liked it and he wanted to go forward and unfortunately his he progressively got sick you know rather quickly after that so there was times where i met a couple people about doing books and that kind of thing i mean you did you did do with brian you did you did a really yeah. really cool amazing amazing book. you got that book and you're yeah. listening to this, you're lucky because that's yeah. a badass book. Like, yeah, with uh, Brian Turcott from Kill Your Idols. We did uh, in 2017, we did a show at the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, and, and we did a book that featured that was the LA Book Fair, right? The LA Book Fair, but usually they have like the biggest space you can get there is about a 20 by 20, and, and Brian was actually able to secure. 
a huge uh, room that was must have been about. It was the biggest room in the event. Yeah, it was the biggest room. And when you walked up to the event, you know, you saw these big old English letters that say "Teen Angels." Um, shout out to my boy JP that was able to. He flew in and he was in Hawaii, and I called him. I said, "Hey, I need these big, huge letters on this wall." And he said, "Man, I'll <laughs> be there." Shit. He says, when Love you need GP. him, I said, Wednesday. And he said, man, I'll be there Tuesday. That's right. Mm-hmm. And he came in with his boy, and they set up these letters. And um, Anyways, Brian and I did this book, which featured the first 180 covers of Teen Angels magazine. And we did 500 books, and they sold out in four days. So that book, I've seen that book sell for $1,000 on eBay now. So that yeah. book, if you got it, like Bobby said, I I think I have four of them. <laughs> sure. I'm going to go look, make sure mine's still sitting on the shelf out there. But yeah, I when when I started seeing how much they were selling for, you know, between $800 and $1,000, I was like, man. And I was like giving them to friends because, you know, I think Brian and I- But you were I, giving them to the right friends. No, I was giving I, them I, to- I, I was right there. Like usually yeah. the books were here and the right people. Yeah, you, you and, and it, I was giving them to people who had kind of- seen me going through the journey you know a lot of tattoo artists and and artists in general chicano and lowrider artists so that yeah i would you know i'd see friends come through i say hey man and here's the book or they you know i had about 10 after the show and i gave quite a few you know a few of them away to people who came through that were that i felt you know were had been a part of my life during that journey or were really huge teen angel fans yeah so yeah, like you say, Teen Angel kind of entrusted me. And, and before he passed, he said, man, uh, you know what, what, where my heart is when it comes to my art and where it comes to promoting my art. He said, from this point forward, you're my eyes and you're my ears and you're my voice. You know what I want. And so in a way, that's a gift, but it's also... A burden because now it's, it's I feel responsibility. I feel responsible to carry the story uh, yeah. forward. So it's a huge responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. So I'm kind of a, a guy myself that likes to lay low and kick back. Duh. <laughs> and now I feel <laughs> the resp- most kick back. <laughs> I feel responsible to carry yeah. this story forward. So I have that on my shoulders to continue with his story and and tell you know the history of. So what are you thinking? Like, where, 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 I mean, what, would you, what would you like to see? Because you know me, dude, and, and this is just David and I. I push this dude. Like, I'm like, yeah. dude, like, I'll, I'll try to set up meetings, try to set up, you know, things. And I want to see this thing because I, I, I've i heard the story. I know the story. I've lived a part of the story with David. Um, But it's so much larger than, you know, than than what's out there now. It's a, it's a, a true story of, of Americana. Like it, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it's an amazing story. And like I said, those, t- not just Teen Angel story, but the story of the relationship you had with him. Um, I think that, that would be really cool. And then continue to, to find ways to, to share his art through, yeah. through books or maybe another magazine one day or. Yeah. My or goal knows. would be to someday possibly see it in a documentary form. Um, and that's kind of where my heart is. I would like to see that happen. And I try to stay relevant uh, with keeping people in tune with, you know, I've done some some clothing, you know, some T-shirts and stuff like that with his artwork on them. But I'm more, I would like to gear it more towards print, you know, towards books and magazines and maybe some prints. And then it would be nice at some point if we could either do a book about his life or a documentary. Yeah, that's, that's what I would like to say. That, that that's what I think. So, mm-hmm. but as far as um, going back to David, yeah, um, let's talk about me. Let's talk yeah. about- <laughs> nah. I if, feel bad for if, all the other. If, if any, if anybody knows this dude, um, he's got a, a lot of other things that he does, but he's got one of the cleanest, or probably one of the most famous cleanest, rarely seen. Because he, <laughs> he takes his shit out like once every couple years. It's a it's a gold, beautiful OG gold sixty seven Impala. It's 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 clean as hell. So I know that that you've been low riding for a while. And how did that all work out? I know your your brothers Vic and and Carlos and and um, you know you guys have been involved in the San Diego low rider community f- for years. And how, how did that all go down? And well, my first, I, you know. 
1983, my first car was a 65 T-Bird. And Bobby and I kind of have that in, in common because I think Bobby's first car was a 64 T-Bird. was a 64, yeah. And so I got the car passed down from my brother. But that was 1983, I believe. And my brother, uh, he had it like on some Kragers and lowered. And he sold it to me for $350. And that's when I was like... I mean, that was my first introduction to like low riding. And then after that, I had a Regal. And then I started getting into the Impalas and stuff. And so I had a few 64 Impalas and I had a 62. And then finally, in 2005, I was I was building a 64 uh, hardtop. And I had it all in my garage, all in pieces and you know, it was just the shell, and I had the engine on a stand, and I had the interior done, but it was all wrapped up. And my wife at that time, she was pregnant, and she said, hey, you know, I'm pregnant, you know, we're going to have a baby. And I was like, oh, I ain't never going to finish this car. So at that time, uh, I had about almost $15,000 into that car, and I thought, man, I need to, you know, just get me something that's put together. So I, I went on the Internet, and I was searching for a 63 Impala, something that was already done. And I came across the 67, and it took me back to a time when I was about 14, 15 years old. There was a dude from my neighborhood, um, an older homeboy. He was like 18, 19, and he had a 68, you know, fastback, and it was lifted in the back on 520s and hubcaps. And I said, I always remember seeing him and the homies cruise around with bandanas and brims. I always thought, man, that's a bad ride. So when I came across the 67, which is very similar to 68, I said, man... I want that car. And they weren't popular in 2005. And I said, man, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I want to do me a 67. And so I sold that 64 and I bought this 67 and it had 46,000 original miles. And the old man had just passed the original owner. And the car was like a time capsule, man. It was beautiful. I got it for $6,500. And you yeah. sell it to me for seven thousand. <laughs> yeah, that's a five hundred dollar profit. <laughs> I got you, David. I, it's yeah. all good. <laughs> and then at the time, I just thought, man, I'm going to build this car the way I would have did it back when I was, you know, a youngster, if I was eighteen, nineteen years old. And and so I just wanted it clean with five twenties and hubcaps. And I remember the first show I took it to in in '06 because uh, the car didn't need much. The original interior, the chrome was beautiful. I just had. Uh, Chico, a friend of ours, painted the factory color because it had a lot of door dings on it. And I airbagged it, put skirts and the hubcaps and the 520s. And I took it to Chicano Park Day, I think in 2006. And it was on hubcaps. And everybody was coming up to me and saying, hey, uh, when are you going to put rims on it? Are you going to put some spokes on it? What, 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 you're saving up for your rims? People that don't know shit yeah. were telling me. And nobody was running hubcaps at that time. And I was like, no, nah, man, this is it. This is the this is the look I want. And they were like, what? Don't you want Dayton's? I was like, no, man, this is this is old school right here. Yeah. And now, after that, you know, the last 10 years, I see a lot of cars, Impalas, just laid out on hubcaps. It's a bad look. It's yeah, kind it of is. like an old neighborhood look, you know? Yeah. The way we used to see them in the neighborhood. Yep. You got a, a clean and pull off an old lady and just you drop it. Cut the coils or lift it in the back and throw some five twenties on it and you were good to go. Yeah. And you're a member of, of Life Life Car Life, Club. Or? Life Car Club. It's a car club. From your neighborhood. From my neighborhood. Yeah. There's a, we got I think fifteen guys in the club and, and probably twelve of us are from the neighborhood. So uh you know, it's not like uh, a real well-known club we don't have like you know turntable cars we we're just kind of neighborhood cars we we're all guys that grew up together and most of the guys in the neighbor in the car club i've known since i was 10 11 12 years old so it's a tight-knit little bunch group. of real old dudes huh? yeah <laughs> old. <laughs> Limp from everybody with the, uh, canes and whatnot <laughs> That's a shit. Is there any anybody else you want anybody you want to shout out or anything you want to say or you know? No, just, I mean I I I, I kind of want to think. I mean Johnny's here with us, and maybe people don't give you the the recognition or the credibility, but um, in terms, I want to thank you for everything you do for the San Diego community, the low riding community, and the that. Chicano community. Thank you, thank you. But you bring a lot of people together, even like. It, you know, 
Johnny and I. I matter of fact, I was me and you were together the first time we met Johnny. And it in, was at, uh, at Oceanside? No, it was at Escondido Cruise Night. And he had his Packard there. And I told Bobby, hey, check this ride out, man. And we started walking around. And that's when Bobby started talking to you. And he was like, you guys found out you lived by yeah, each other. Yeah. 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 So and then we've we've been on a couple trips together. Yeah, it, it's it's we were we were uh, uh, roomie, bunkies in, uh, in, in Japan. In Japan, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Bobby organizes some good trips. Bobby is all about traveling and That's and good. all about throwing shows. I mean, he's just well. These guys have both helped with legacy and helped me with a yeah. lot of the shows too. So. so Bobby has brought us into you know to be be part of the tribal clique, and that's an, an important. It's an honorable role to, for us to hold because i mean it just we get you know we're well, you're well respected wherever you go and, and we get that same respect so yeah back in i think we it was a good time man that's, yeah that's all we have when a, was we the classic legends show in that Japan. that you know it's funny you say that because i was just gonna say that i was gonna rudely interrupt you guys and say that was probably the best car show mm-hmm. i've ever been to and i've been to a lot of car shows like you guys have and mm-hmm. not just shown cars but you know been to car shows but that show was on some other yeah, shit. If any, off the hook. that's I don't know. Did you have you guys ever been to a better show than that classic legend show no. in Japan? N- not both both hangers or whatever were filled with rides that and blow outside. Off. Remember, yeah. Like, yeah, just the quality of cars, the hospitality, and and there wasn't you know I don't know there was maybe. 40 people from the maybe 50 people from la san diego combined out there something like that there wasn't a lot of us we were fortunate because oreo who was doing 38 times magazine from japan at the time invited tribal out there and he invited teen angels and he invited a couple other uh, compton david was out there with yes yeah he invited a few different brands out there so Bobby put together a group of probably about 10 to 15 of us and we all uh we went out there and we had a blast man we had such a good time in Japan we all made Tokyo. some money sold we, some product yeah. yep we had stands out there at the show but yeah the show was probably the best lowrider event show that I've ever been me to me too man like I don't know if it was just cuz of- the quality of cars was just <laughs> incredible just everything, man. That whole day, the vibe. That, that yep. whole day, the vibe, and, and just you know, there was a lot of our friends from the guys from us versus them were out there, and um, Dead End Magazine was out mm-hmm. there, and of course, um, Esteban was out there, and um, man, there was a Luke, lot, you know, Luke, went Luke with, Westman, Luke Compton went David, with and Compton David went. With Frank us. was out yeah. there with us, and there was a lot of really, really really cool people and we was that the show that we slept on the floor and some like yeah, yeah we, we in like Nagoya it was like, yeah it was yeah. like a Japanese they thought it was cool to put us in like a Japanese style hotel oh, and we're yeah. like yeah let's go well there's a mat this is your bed here's yeah. the floor like, like it was but it was cool it was an experience yeah. and it was it was it was a, a good time and, and Nagoya's got such an amazing amazing lowrider scene but I'm sure that you know, going back to the Teen Angel thing, the influence that the Teen Angel has had on a lot of these artists, like there's that really sick Japanese artist who who just does badass work, and you can tell he's really been inspired yeah, by Night, Teen, Night the yeah, Funkster. Yeah, Night the Funkster. That mm-hmm. that that dude gets gets down. So shout out to him and just everybody who who understands what's going. But as far as the whole, you know, the whole Teen Angel thing, and and I'm excited to see where it goes, and and um. You know, I'll I'll do as much as I can for it, and I know Johnny's always down for it too. Look, he even rocked his Teen Angel tribal yeah, shirt today. Man. See that? Yeah. I came in. I was man, like, how can I get one of those? What's <laughs> in the back of that one? It's the Whittier sign one, right? Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So yeah, we did that that poster and T-shirt and stuff like that. But there'll there'll be a lot more coming, and um, I think just Johnny you got anything to no, to add just in? yeah, just um, thank you for sharing the story. Thank you for taking the time to get to know you know somebody that's uh, really important to our time period, our culture, our neighborhood, stuff like that. Um, as well as knowing or, or as well as sharing the artwork, continuing to share his wisdom and knowledge, and like you said earlier, like he was passionate about his art. And he wanted right. to share it with everyone. And yeah. he, he portrayed, you know, our our neighborhoods, our culture in a positive manner, you know, such yeah. as 
the one um, drawing he did where they welcome a new baby and all the homeboys are right there, right. you know, all that's celebrating. A one. Yeah. yeah, like that's a positive imagery of otherwise, you know, what uh, what the other media portrays people like us yeah. of of doing, like yeah. just gang members or or waiters or just you know just random stuff, and then it, it wasn't a real reflection of of life that we knew it and. Right. And I remember when I was little going to Lopez Market is where they had the Teen Angel magazines right there and seeing them and going through them. And, and in middle school, like having them and, and draw, taking drawings from Teen Angel in middle school in art class and, and drawing those and tracing those yeah. and, and having like, I remember it was a 50 Belair like in front of a, a like a, like a, a house or something. And yeah. I remember doing that. Right. And it's a big influence on me. Um, and, and it's very like it's 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 great to see that it's not going to end. You know, he right. he passed away, rest in peace. But his legacy, he trusted you with to to keep it going. And and I no think no pressure. The, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no pressure. I think the well, I mean, he couldn't have left it in, in better hands, right? I mean, right. I mean, I, I agree. I'm the one, I'm the I agree. Yeah. you know I have I had that connection with him, and uh, so yeah, I, I I was honored to be able to to carry it forward. And, and when I do these shows, uh, it's like, it's never about me, man. I'm just, I get pumped because I'm so pumped for people to know the story. I know there's so many artists out there that are kind of emulating the, the art style. And I feel real honored when I'm able to, I get some young tattoo artists who come through here sometimes and, and I tell them the story and I show them the artwork and they're just, you could tell they're genuinely uh, thankful to be able to know the story and to see some of this art in person and really realize like, man, this is, you know, kind of the, the foundation f for what I'm doing now. So I get a lot of, you know, artists, tattoo artists that are in their thirties now and, and they've maybe s s Google imaged, you know, some teenage artwork or they've seen it online or something. So, they get pretty pumped when they hear the story and they see the the artwork in person, some real pieces. Yeah, it's a real honor to like see original pieces hanging on the wall, oh like in your God. office. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's just because he doesn't have enough space in there to put it. Yeah, it's, it's it's top to bottom, like all you can fit in there. And I know you got a lot more than that too. Yeah, if do. people want to see um, Teen Angel magazines, Teen Angel artwork, I know you have an IG, but. Um, what is the Instagram and where else can they see Teen yeah, Angel work or anything related to Teen Angel? Official Teen Angel is the Instagram account. And basically that's it. When I'm going to do a book or a show or something, I'll post it up on there. I don't, I'm not as active on Instagram as I probably should be. It's hard for me. I mean, social media is hard for me. Yeah. It's, it's a difficult thing because there is some negativity that comes with it. Yeah. And man, with Teen Angel, I've been so pumped and so positive about just spreading his story and his legacy. And so when it gets a little negative, sometimes it's hard for me to, to push forward. Um, and I've never been into, I'm 55, so I know a lot of people are into Instagram. It's, it's just hard for me to, yeah. to stay cr current. So what's the best way for people to see, like try to go to get a book or is there... I well, mean, hopefully, we'll, this year I want to do some more prints. Yeah, and uh, we would like to do a book, or you know, I, I like I want to shout out to Chata. You know, a lot of people follow Chata on Instagram, mm -hmm. uh, and she's kind of she's been my, I guess you'd say my assistant. Yeah, because she's a little bit more active. Yeah, and she's younger, and so she's more hip to what's happening, and so she kind of pushes me, and she'll post things for me and she yeah. kind of stays stays current with what's happening and and the dudes from born and raised like shout out to those dudes shout out I, to to san to, to spanto spanto, spanto yeah. from uh born and raised yeah um like for Bobby recognizing said, it and, and yeah and and actually doing yeah. collabs with you respectfully and yeah out, you know? like you know a lot of brands reach out and want to do something but i really have to, it's not about making money on my end it's about respecting Teen Angel as an artist and as you know what he did the Teen Angels magazine so when Spanto reached out through Born and Raised you know I, I 
saw the brand as kind of coming from the streets as well. And, and, and he respectfully reached out and wanted to do a collab. So that was a cool collab. I've done yeah. collabs with Bobby here from Tribal. Yeah. And so a lot of people reach out, but if, if I don't really see them as a credible brand or as really in touch with what Teen Angel was about, if they're just, just trying to make money and not really respecting the culture or, or the artists, then I just don't do, do any collabs yeah. with them. Right on, man. Well, thanks for, um, for doing the podcast. For me, I was excited about it because I'm excited for people to know the story. Like, like I said, those, those two stories. Um, and you know, it's, it's for taking the time out of your busy day because I know you got a lot of shit going on and I, I know you, you, you move real quick. I'm, I'm a fast mover, man. Oh, I'm a God. fast. I go like this. I go like that. <laughs> uh, for those that know, we know the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Probably the reason that, that, uh, I don't post so much because it takes me that long time. <laughs> a long time. Hit that button. So we'll just leave post. the word sloth on the table. We're not going to say anything. <laughs> no sloth, no snails. Yeah, yeah, none of that. But No, I uh, take my time. Bobby right knows on, that. Right on. Well, we appreciate you doing the Lord Left Podcast. Johnny, be good. Bobby Tribal also. Um, thank you, Bobby, and thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to all the – DJ Julian Ramirez for uh, f- for some music, the sounds. And um, just everything else that, that people that contribute to the podcast, DJ Artistic, Johnny Be Good, The Lower Left Podcast, 17th and Island, San Diego. Check us out on Spotify, Apple Tune, Apple Podcasts, Apple Podcast. and YouTube. YouTube. Um, like it where you can. Subscribe. We appreciate it. The Lower Left Podcast. We're out. Peace. <laughs>